In England, we find Roman baths almost 2,000 years old. And the remnant, center of Roman rule, was the Forum at Rome, heart of an empire that fell nearly 15 centuries ago. Yet Rome once looked like this. How did such a vast, powerful empire disintegrate? To try to answer this, let us examine something of four periods in the history of the empire. Four periods associated with Marcus Aurelius, the soldier emperors, Diocletian, and Romulus Augustulus. Our first period begins with Emperor Marcus Aurelius. During his reign, the Roman Empire was at a high point in peace, power, and wealth. The empire of many lands stretched from the border of Scotland to the rivers of Mesopotamia and contained about 75 million people. Life during much of the reign of Aurelius went smoothly. In the provinces, owners of the great villas were wealthy and secure. Even though an estate owner had little say in his government, he could take pride in being a loyal Roman citizen. His wealth and prestige came from the vast lands of the estate worked by slaves or tenant farmers. With the empire at its height, life on the land was good, and life was good in the cities as well. People of all classes went about their daily affairs peacefully, securely. Students read and discussed Roman writings that reflected cultures absorbed from the many peoples Rome ruled. The shopkeeper was part of the Roman commercial system that gathered and distributed the products of many lands. This silk brocade came from Damascus, an example of the empire's far-flung commerce. To the merchants from many lands, Roman roads, such as this one, offered excellent communication. The Roman peace guaranteed that travelers might go from one end of the empire to the other in safety. In camps and forts in the empire and on its borders, a large and capable Roman army guarded the Roman peace. A loyal Roman army was an important instrument of government, a source of power for a strong emperor. And Marcus Aurelius was a strong emperor. He was also a learned man. As he once wrote, the universe is change. And change did come to the empire. Following the death of Aurelius came a period of great trouble for Rome. Within 50 years came a series of so-called soldier emperors, whose names are seldom heard today. Maximinus, Gordianus, Philippus, Decius, and others. In all, 22 emperors in 50 years. This period of the soldier emperors saw the beginning of the decline of the empire. Let us remember that the vast Roman world was centered in Rome and held together by a system of absolute power in the hands of the emperor. Every emperor needed the support of the military to control the vast empire. It became more and more apparent by the third century AD that whoever controlled the army could become emperor. For out in Rome's vast provinces, any general who commanded troops might attempt to seize power. And more and more, the soldiers realized that they played a vital role. They could decide what general to support and thus, in effect, create an emperor. And so, for about 50 years, emperors were made and unmade by the sword. The result, disorder and civil war in the empire. Lands within the empire were laid waste. Defenseless villas, once secure under the Roman peace, were plundered by Roman troops of one faction or another. In the cities, too, conditions were bad. Shops stood empty as the wars obstructed commerce. There were other troubles. A terrible epidemic swept through the empire, taking heavy toll of the population. Food shortage and increasing poverty meant starvation for many. 
These were the citizens of a declining empire. When the border defences were weakened by strife within the empire, Rome's enemies attacked. The Persians from the east. In Europe, tribes of Saxons, Franks and Alemanni penetrated into the empire. The Goths broke across the Danube line and later raided Greece and Asia Minor. These destructive attacks were finally checked, but the attackers were not conquered. They waited for a better chance. During this half century of strife, a total of 22 soldier emperors reigned. This half century saw the onset of the decline of the Roman Empire. At the end of this period, a strong emperor, Diocletian, subdued the armies and again established peace. Diocletian built these baths and other great public works. But in the cities, there was less business activity. Population had declined. On the land, farmers still gathered their crops, but the yields were smaller now. It is believed that in many areas, an important cause of decline was exhaustion of the soil. One way Diocletian tried to stem the decline was by reorganizing the government. He divided the empire into two parts, west and east. He personally ruled the east, and he appointed a co-emperor to rule jointly in the west. He further subdivided the empire into prefectures. In each prefecture, officials were responsible to the co-emperors. One result of this reorganization was a great increase in municipal officials. One Roman writer said that half the population was in government service. Many were needed to collect the increased taxes levied throughout the empire. A top-heavy government was placing a crushing burden on its citizens. By imperial decrees, Diocletian and his successors tried to freeze the economy into stability. For example, no citizen would be allowed to change his occupation. A tradesman must stay at his trade, and his heirs too. Perhaps the hardest hit by the imperial edicts were the tenant farmers. They were bound to the land, unable to move away. For protection and help, a colonus or tenant farmer usually turned not to the unyielding government, but to the wealthy landholder, becoming his serf. Freedom was surrendered for security, and yet even the landholder in the empire often felt insecure. For comfort, he might turn to books of Roman literature or philosophy. He might even forsake his Roman gods to accept the gods of older religions brought into the empire from the east. A new religion, Christianity, was spreading throughout the empire with particular appeal to the masses. Christianity, more than other religions, offered hope and salvation to Romans seeking spiritual comfort. Roman armies, once the backbone of the empire, were no longer invincible conquerors. In her weakness, Rome was giving way to the pressure of barbarian forces outside her borders. Roman armies were enlisting German tribesmen and other foreigners into their army. The Barians came to know Roman culture, to adopt Roman ways. With this blending of peoples, the last period of the decline had begun. The final century and a half of the empire is remembered mostly for the reign of Constantine, an outstanding ruler who became sole emperor in 324 AD. He made Christianity the state religion of the empire. Constantine moved the capital of the empire from Rome to his newly built city of Constantinople, feeling that the Eastern Empire had better chances of survival. This proved true. The Eastern Empire lasted over a thousand years. Yet it was here, near Adrianople, in 378 AD, that Rome lost a crucial battle. Gothic tribes pushed across the Danube frontier and destroyed a Roman army at Adrianople. 
Now, the hundred-year period of terrible invasions which destroyed the Western Empire began. The Roman garrisons were overrun by the barbarians. The conquerors became, at last, the conquered. The invaders made slaves of some of the Roman people. The fine Roman roads stood open for other invaders to follow, and they did follow. The Eternal City, Rome, was twice sacked during this period, by Goths in 410 and by Vandals in 455. The Imperial City had come to this, a rich prize for savage warriors. No more would Rome be the ruler of the Western world. The confusion of this final period came to an end during the brief reign of Romulus Augustulus, a boy who was the last Roman emperor. A powerless figurehead, the boy symbolized a helpless empire. Then the barbarian general, Odoacer, ended the farce, deposing the boy. He was the last of a long line of emperors, emperors who ruled during dramatic centuries of the decline of the Roman Empire. The year was 476 AD. The conquerors marveled at the outward signs of Rome's past greatness. In time, they would come to share in Rome's accumulation of culture, her feats of engineering, of architecture, her gifts of law and organization. These things did not die. Eventually, out of the decline of the Roman Empire, a new and different age would arise in Western Europe.